Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, December 18th, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but uh, there's a lot going on in the market, and there's a lot of other stuff I want to show you, too. So I'm going to go again, ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew so we can get it all in. We should have plenty of time today, though. So if you don't, um, don't worry about your stock picks. We'll get to them all. I promise. I work hard to get them all at least. Make us a Mountain Dew to not compensate me for this, but uh, PepsiCo, be out there. I will. Uh, I will give you a shout out. All right. Well, I guess we have to look at the obligatory disclaimer screen, and I could sum that up for you really quick. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Excuse me, I got a little shuffling around. I got to put my mat down. <clears throat> All right. Hey, do me a favor. You read the book? You like the book? Throw me a bone. Put me up a review on Amazon.com. And the reason I ask for reviews is obvious, but one reason is because there are some malignant people out there who review their reviews, meaning they don't bother reading the book, they just read the reviews and, and they make their opinion based on reviews. I know, it's crazy. Can you believe it, huh? Anyway, um, so if you get a chance, throw me a bone and put me up a review on Amazon. I'm having some difficulty with my pen today. Let's see if we can get to work. Huh, interesting. Here we go. And hold your mouth right. All right, let's see if that will fix itself. Okay, um, what are we going to talk about? Well, we got another dead money report. Yay, that's always a good thing. Uh, speaking of dead, IPO bull market not dead yet. We talked about that uh, last week. And I'm going to cover some of the things, uh, or a couple of things at least, I'm going to cover tomorrow in the IPO uh, last uh, follow-up session. That will make more sense when we get there. Let's see if I can get this pen to work. Anybody know what I'm doing wrong? I needed to go back to pen. Oh, here we go. Oh, for a second I thought I wouldn't have a pen. Um, I've been doing these dead money reports lately. Well, because we've had some positions that uh, have kind of flatlined for a while and then um, ended up profitable overall. And the market doesn't always move on your time frame. I mean, if it did, we'd all be rich by now and uh, we, we no longer would have to come to work. Uh, but the reality is it does take time for our moves to develop. And the definition of dead money from Investopedia.com is a slang term for money invested in security with minor hopes of appreciation or earning a return. The problem is you don't know if something's not going to work or not when you get into it. In fact, we got in this one here as a short, believe it or not. And it actually went against this initially and then came back in and then it went against us again. And so... At this point, it's dead money, but then notice that it becomes profitable for a while, and then it stops working, and then, bam, it uh, makes a nice move lower. In fact, with a little discretion following this thing down intraday, uh, this, a lot more could have even been squeezed out of this position. But the reason I'm showing you this is because it did stop out yesterday. This stop isn't exactly the scale, but you get the idea. We trailed it lower, and it stopped out. Now, there was a lot of time spent in this position where, it sort of backed up in the profitability, but that's okay because you don't know if this thing's going to go down to zero and you're just going to ride it down. And it's okay to have an open position for a while, and sometimes moves take time to develop. So these moves up here uh, did set the world on fire, but it's uh, better than the polka eye, 19% and then 14%, and that's a three-letter stock, so that's not a bad move at all. All right, any questions on dead money? And uh, to those who are, who are new to these webcasts, go in and watch the last couple of weeks. In fact, last week's is on um, YouTube, so you can have that one for free. Um, we did talk a little bit more about dead money in detail then, and, and then weeks prior, too. And, again, the market doesn't always move on your time frame. Sometimes you have to wait for things to develop. Now, we've been talking about the bull market and IPOs for most of the year. It seems like... Uh, it, we had a bull market, 
and kind of this is like the IPO bull market, and then I did a, a presentation on IPOs that kind of lagged for a while, and then it looks like it's kind of taken off again. And this is why after the presentation, what I did was I spread out my following presentations over the next several months or for the remainder of the year, just so we would see a variety of conditions. And what I do in these presentations is um, I teach the material, and that's the theory, and then I want to go out and show it in practice. So at the end of this presentation and in these presentations, I went out and picked, uh, we haven't done this one yet, I went out and picked uh, particular stocks. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. Before we get into that, let me just show you, uh, I thought it would be kind of fun to pick out the IPOs from my trading service over the last year. Now, this one line is discretionary, one line is mechanical, and I'll explain that in a lot more detail in just one second. And you could see that the IPOs uh, did fairly well uh, towards by the end of the year. Okay, this was uh, set up a couple days ago. So it includes um, all of 2014, and some of these triggered early 2013. Uh, I'm sorry, early late 2013. So, but they they were closed out in 2014. So these are the complete closed out trades. Um, and then there are a couple of them that are still open now. And the reason the discretionary portfolio did a little better is because, and I'll show you this in just one second, but we had like one or two that triggered, came back in, hit the stop, but just barely, and then took off. So if you're using discretion, which a lot of my clients do, because I've taught it and preached it and um, sermon after sermon on it, then instead of making this one trade where you get in here and lose money, and then you got to come back in and take that second entry, um, which the mechanical portfolio does, you end up just sticking with the trade. You'll notice that um, the missed trades here, so there were two missed trades, two or three missed trades because of that. So that's why uh, this line is shifted over to the right. But if you notice that they are pretty much equal, if you or exactly equal if you if you line them up. But then notice that this one takes a dive because those trades, and there's two parts of the trade, so those are reflected in here and that's why it goes down so discretion does help that's one thing that I wanted to point out with this uh, one other thing that I noticed was and we'll take a look at the, the slide here there was no real outliers to speak of and the most of the trades now we do have some open ones which we'll talk about in one second and it's these open ones that have made this last little run in here um, possible but there was really no outliers to speak of unless these uh, last little few take over. So, you know, year ain't over yet. So we'll see what CTLT, Kite, and Ruby do. And all of those uh, so far are profitable. And CTLT and Kite have already hit the initial profit target. So, so far, so good. So we might have a couple of winners there. So I want to stop short of saying that the thinner IPOs have more opportunities. But it does appear... And, you know, maybe we don't have a full representative sample, but it does appear that the thinner IPOs have a little bit better chance of making that bigger outlier move than the thicker ones. But I don't want to say that the thicker ones cannot make that move because we had maybe our sample isn't large enough because in 2013, SCTY, which was a fairly thicker or I should say uh, higher in volume, a lot of times them, those of you outside of the United States ask me what do I mean by thicker. Uh, a thin stock is one that where the volume is low. The volume is thin, and when I say thick, it means that the volume is thick. There's a lot of volume. So thick means a lot. Thin means a little. Uh, but the thinner ones, if you go back in and watch some of the courses that I've done where I'll draw the arrow like this, and you have inefficiency up here, and then you have efficiency down here. Now, efficiency stocks don't move as much and so as the volume decreases I'm sorry as the volume increases the stocks become more and more efficient so let's move these around so let's assume this is volume going out well this is to become more and more efficient and these would be inefficient I, but I wouldn't make the I wouldn't make the case flat out with the IPOs that the thinner ones aren't are necessarily going to produce more outliers but as a general statement thinner stocks do have more potential, thinner within reason, to uh, become 
outliers and make that huge inefficient type of move. Uh, one thing that came out of this studying just the IPOs by ripping the IPOs out of the portfolio for last year is that uh, discretion does make a big difference. So you can see it still did pretty good, followed mechanically, but with discretion it did even better. Okay. So that's important. So that's that works with the core methodology, and then maybe it works even more so with the IPOs because they are inefficient and can make these large moves. But one thing that we talked about quite a, quite a lot is with an IPO, because they are more inefficient, there's going to be more shakeouts and fakeouts along the way. So sometimes you might have a deeper trace, but and then it takes off again. So maybe a little discretion around that stop, or it might just start off and have a few little shakeout moves before the trend again. So a little discretion around that. Um, in some of these ones where we did not catch an outlier in 2014, if you go in and look at them, you'll see that some of them did have major long-term trends like this, but they did have some serious corrections in between. And this is something we got into. There's not enough time to get into it today, but we did get into it in the IPO course. There are reasons why IPOs do this, because there's a lot of insiders who are on the hook, so to speak, looking to get out. Those with sweat equity, those with uh, equity equity, those with um, uh, those VC, the venture capitalists, and they're looking for a payday. And that does put a little selling pressure on the IPO, and that's when you can have these deep retracements. Now, let's go back to the discretion thing. This was Zen, which was one of those IPOs. You can see it triggered it here. Immediately came back down, and it just barely kind of nicked the stop, kind of messed around a little bit, and then took off again. We took a second entry on this one, or I put out. I, I personally took one trade only, but in the service, I put a second trade here because I still like the stock after after it uh, had that second little shakeout. So a little discretion. If your stop's right here and it just comes down, it kind of kisses the stop a little bit. Don't throw caution to the wind and let it come all the way down here. But let it dip below that a little bit, see what happens. And if it begins to stabilize, and if by the end of the day it's well above the stop, then stick with the position. So that's something that I teach quite often. If you have layman's, uh, take a look at the um, – second uh, half of layman's and I talk about um, using a little discretion. Now I did want to point out that thicker stocks or higher volume stocks in the IPOs can move nicely so I went back to last year and this one stood out. I didn't look at all the IPOs from last year. I just looked at one of them because I remembered it. You, you tend to remember the winners and forget about the losers. But this one, you can see, is an outlier type of move. It ran up about 300%. And these are the ones that we are looking for. and uh, Or these are the ones that we've been waiting for. How did they say that one time? We are the ones that we've been looking for. But so even these IPOs, this one was a little bit higher in volume than some of your run-of-the-mill IPOs. So they can still move. So I don't want to make the point that they can't move. But the point I make it is maybe there is a slight chance of catching an outlier in these thinner ones within reason. And the beauty of that is as a private trader, you can go in and trade some of these thinner ones. And that's why you're not seeing some of these thinner ones in the service because I tend to want I want to put a little bit more liquid stocks in the service so that we all could trade them. There's enough to go around. Uh, so there's a repeatability. So someone can't say that, well, that stock's kind of thin. That would have been hard to trade. Uh, you could actually go in and trade these stocks because there's plenty enough shares to do it. And a lot of times they'll trigger, and even after the trigger, maybe not a lot of happen, you still could get in. Like even in this case, even after this trigger in here, there still was plenty of time to get in this stock. It wasn't like it just um, it makes a trigger on a fast move, hits the profit target, comes right back in, and that's it. Or it's like a flash in the pan uh, it, it, with these thicker stocks or with these higher volume stocks. There's time to get in a lot of times for the move, and there's repeatability. So that's why, uh, and in general, too, when, I, when we're doing these presentations, uh, I, I will tend to steer you towards a little bit more volume in the stocks within reason. 
Okay, usually around 250k or more. Anything over 100 or 500k is usually plenty enough volume to trade. And the IPOs, we don't have that volume history, so we have to go off a few days in there. And sometimes it, it becomes a bit of a guess, and it take you you kind of have to take a stab at it. But the good news is, with IPOs, more volume tends to flow into the market um, if the stock begins to take off. Whereas with uh, established issue, an issue that's been on the market for years, then the volume you see is the volume you have as a general statement, and it can be a little dangerous to trade with this less volume. Not to say that it's not dangerous trading in IPOs with very light volume, but um, as a general statement, you can go after, as a private trader, you can go after some of these thinner IPOs. I have a couple of dead money stocks that are touching sell stocks because of tax selling. Should I hold at least the beginning of next year, Gary James. You know that's a that's a that's an RIA question. That's a CTA question. Um, I'm not an RIA. I'm not a CTA. But if they're just kind of if they're just kind of nicking the stop, then as a as a trader guy, I would say that let them nick the stop, and you've got one additional reason to um, to keep those stocks. But be warned, and and this is the this is probably the best thing I can tell you, is never let tax decisions influence your trading decisions. Okay, now there's some um, I'm sure some CTA just spit on a screen, has spit his coffee out on a screen for me saying that, but if you're going to be a trader, you need to follow your trading rules, and you need to forget about any sort of tax implications that there might be okay so and I know that's in the back of your mind is tax law selling but if if the um, if it's just kind of nicking it from a traders perspective then it's okay to stick with it okay so the bottom line is don't let the tax decisions influence your trading decisions but I hear you. If it's just kind of nicking them and you're you're trying to hold on to them anyway until January 1st at least, then I hear you. Okay. Okay. Now, let's take a look at the follow-up sessions at the um, the IPO course. Now, it's 1 through 3. I've got one more session left, and we're going to do that one tomorrow. And I'll mention that towards the end of the presentation again. And uh, these aren't necessarily sequential, so this is a little confusing in that these are like closed, the way they closed out in here. Um, and the, the other chart actually wasn't sequential anyway, either too. So they weren't necessarily, um, you might have had open trades down here when this is at a loss, and uh, vice, you know, down here too also, okay? But so far, and this is where patience come in. Patience comes in, and you have to let things unfold. So far, uh, we're doing pretty good. Now, this is uh, only this was uh, I did this I think in the middle of uh, was it seven? I think I did it like around the middle of June or July. So that's only the second half of the year. And the the secret to this success, the real secret to this success, even though it was modestly successful up until recently, but the big secret is. There were a couple of big outliers that came in, and we'll, which we'll look at uh, in just a minute. You can see that this is a huge move in here. Now, this is—I um, went ahead and, and stuck with the 100K model, two percent on these, uh, and so that's with the money management. Now, it's not trying. I don't want to try to show you, um, you know, something crazy like, oh, we'll just throw 10,000 shares in each one and see what it'll do. I wanted to put some money management. So these outliers that took off in here are very conservative as far as the amount of shares because they had very loose stops, which, as we learned last week, the looser the stops, the fewer the shares. And I could have certainly uh, did it without money management and made it look a heck of a lot more impressive. But these were the ones that triggered recently. Uh, this is Cala, C-A-L-A, -A, um, and somebody asked me to cover this. I'll cover this later in the presentation, too. Uh, it was a breakout type of pattern. It took off nicely. Uh, running up about um, well, tripling in value, as you can see from where it in entered. Uh, and VTAE was another one, was a breakout pattern in here. 
and so far so good. Looks like it's uh, pretty much doubled in value so far. So those have really helped. You can see have helped the um, the IPOs picked. And then tomorrow, hopefully, I hate to use the word hope, but boy, pressure's on. Hopefully, I could pick a couple of more winners to finish out the year. Okay. So uh, the gleamings from this is that these are a little bit thinner than would probably show up in the core IP the core service. Um, and as a private trader, you could trade them. And we have caught a couple of outliers here. But we've got three open ones in the service that have the potential to become outliers. So I don't want to make a huge case that the thinner ones are going to give you more outliers. But this is the, the based on our sample size, that appears to be the case. But again, we've got three open ones in the, in this, well, actually three open ones in both. We've got three open IPOs from the IPO webinars or in from the um, from the course and then we have three open IPOs in the service so we'll see how it all shakes out in here okay um, any questions on any of that that went a lot smoother and a lot faster than I thought it would okay do you say hope there is no hope in trading there's no crying in trading <laughs> yeah I hear you yeah, you got to be careful with that hope word. Um, but, yeah, you got to be a little positive. A couple of announcements. Um, as I alluded to, I have the last follow-up session. This will, this will close down the course uh, for 2014 that I did in the IPOs. Again, what I like to do, and I think this is a really, really cool thing, and this is why I spread it out so many months, because the bull market kind of, the bull market and IPOs sort of waned a little bit. It's like, into last year, I'm like, gosh, I got to do a course on IPOs. I did, I did the stock selection course, and some of the IPOs that came out in the stock selection course just went to the moon. And you could go to the marketing page and see a few of those. And then it's like, okay, I've got to do an IPO course. And I watched it go up and up and up and up. And finally, I got it all together, got my materials together. It took me about six months to get it all together. And by the time I got it all together and announced, in July, it's like the IPO market began to wane a little bit. So what I like to do is I like to show everything in theory, like here's the setups, this is how you work, this is where you get in, here's some things that worked out really nice in the past, here's some from the service, and here's some historical examples. But then I like to take it one step further and do it in reality, because what good is me teaching you something if you can't go out and parlay that into some, into some money? Okay, to make money from it, and that's why that's what I love about the educational business is if I'm charging you whatever, let's say four hundred dollars for a course, but if you go out and make a couple thousand dollars trading it, not that it can guarantee that, okay, but it happens, okay, it has happened quite often, then I feel pretty good. That becomes a win-win situation, okay. I was able to make a little money off the course and then you were able to make a little money off the course and we were both happy and the good thing is hopefully that's unlimited because the markets will always be there okay anyway enough of that uh, but session is for tomorrow so if you haven't already um, if you don't have the link it's on the countdown on my website for those of you who have uh, purchased that and let me just show you where that is, just in case. And then there's also the page behind the firewall where the IPO information is. So um, you could always go to that page too, if ever you want a, um, an announcement. But I do put it on the home page too, and this will this will apply to future courses too. So if there's a follow-up session to be done in a future course, it'll also be on the. Um, why is this acting up on me? It's going to be right here, if I can make it work, okay? Right here. This is the follow-up course, okay? So just click here, and that's if you already have the IPO course, then you can come to the session tomorrow, okay? And this is where uh, these countdowns are always the next course or the next webinar. So if you're ever wondering when the next one is, just go to the, the home page. Um, I haven't decided on when I'm going to end this. I think I, I might end it at some point in time. I think it's a really good deal, if I say so myself. But the stock selection course, 
which is 1457 you get a free year of the service so uh, it's like buy one you get one free <laughs> and I think that's a pretty good deal okay is this a course in addition to the stock selection yeah there's two separate courses there's the IPO course and then the stock selection course okay um, you know I'm feeling generous right now if you get the stock selection course you'll get a year to service and I'll give you the IPO course okay and uh, just remind me that I said that and this will let me just put an end date on it now until Monday, okay? But if you get it today, you get the IPO service tomorrow, and that's a pretty cool deal. And that excites me with this um, and doing these things and, and being able to, you know, I mean, it sounds a little vain, but this excites me to come out and say, okay, well, this is what we did, and there's your spreadsheet, and that's what happened based on the patterns and based on the stocks that we found doing it. So that's kind of... To me, that's exciting, and that's why I do the follow-up courses to make sure it works and to prove that it works. And it puts a lot of stress on me and a lot of pressure on me, and, and, and I'm not, you know, I don't know for a fact that tomorrow I'm going to pick some big winners, but it's going to be pretty exciting if I do. So tomorrow, tonight, I'm going to eat my Wheaties and get a good night's rest and make sure we find some winners again tomorrow. A um, couple things just highlighting here. I do have a YouTube channel. Check that out if you get a chance. And then I do have an introductory video on the um, on the IPOs. So if you go to my channel and on the stock selection service, I got that one. Um, I'm sorry, stock selection course. I got that one uploaded this morning. So check those YouTubes out if you get a chance. And then uh, join the YouTube channel. I don't think that I don't think you get any emails or spam or anything by doing that. You just get access to the um, to all the videos as soon as they come out. Okay. I'm reminding you. Wait. I'm reminding you now. Be more than happy. Be more than happy. What do you mean? Be more than happy. Is this course in addition. Yes. Yeah, two separate courses. But if you get the big course, I'll give you the little one. Not the little one, but the the other one. Um, there's a small subset of the IPO course that's in the stock selection course, and then I took that and elaborated on it and made it much bigger. Uh, from like um, 30 minutes probably to about four hours worth in that one. So there's a lot more to it than just what uh, was covered in the um, stock selection course. But, yeah, there, there are some of the patterns and some of the things. IPOs are obviously part of stock selection, and you need to know um, some of the patterns, and that's why they were covered in stock selection uh, thing, okay? Okay. Um, Let's take a look at the overall. Any questions? Anything we covered so far? We could always come back to the slides if you want to. We're ahead of schedule today. That's great. Um, I want to take a look at the overall market, and then we'll take a look at um, the sectors, and then we'll um, we'll look at your stocks. In fact, if there are no more questions, we'll go ahead. We go ahead. You can start um, asking about individual stocks. If you don't mind, just ask about one stock at a time. Okay and then hit carriage return and then we'll um that way I can know what which ones are covered and which ones I haven't. Um let's take a look at the P's and then let's um we'll back the charts out a little bit. We'll take a look at the short term and we'll back it out. Um one thing that's been a little concerning in the S and P's obviously is they've been in a bit of a free fall as of late. And they just seemed a little sold out day before yesterday, what's that, I guess Tuesday, but they were still down like another half percent nonetheless, so you can't say that I'm going to rush in and buy them just because they're oversold. And the other thing that was a little concerning was they did drop below their prior breakout levels, which is right around at 2,000, which as you would expect is an inflection point, a big round number like that. And then the other thing that it did was not this not that there's anything magical about it, but it did dip below its 50-day moving average. Now, one thing you could do is wait for a market to have a nice trend above its 50-day moving average, let it come down and kiss the moving average goodbye, and then look to get long when that uptrend resumes. And that's what I call kiss ma goodbye, except I use I think a 20 exponential in layman's in layman's to describe that pattern. 
But as you can see, yesterday was a pretty big do-over in the uh, S&P 500 and the P's. And then, so far, knock on wood, we're having some nice follow-through to the upside. Now, if you take a look at the spiders where you get a true open, not quite as impressive because you can see we backed off a little bit in here. And this is where, not that you want to fight it, but this is where maybe for a day trade you can come in and do like an opening gap reversal trade. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't fight it in here. Uh, just yet. I think I'd let it go. I mean, this could be a nice seasonal move that we're hoping to get. Now, but Dave, I thought you said you're not a big fan of seasonals. I'm not, okay? I'm not really into them, but it's nice when they dovetail in with what I'm doing. And as a trend follower so far, I haven't been uh, shaken out into believing that this market is rolling over. Now, again, as usual, check back often. Now, one thing that's a little concerning is notice that our moving averages have come together, and without today's data, you can see it looked like they were getting ready to cross, and we're going to have a bow tie down. Nothing magical about that, but when you get a bow tie after an all-time high, you need to pay attention. And I think last time it dropped about 7 or 8% out of it, and I thought that that could have been a major top, and it turned out that it wasn't. And that's fine with me. I don't care. Uh, as long as the market goes some, somewhere up or down. Ideally, I want it to go up forever because my life is a lot easier when it does. But you can see that the moving averages were coming together. Now we've got a new piece of information, provided we can hold up here or percent and change or whatever. Now these moving averages, if the market stays up here another day or two, these exponential averages will turn back up, and it will probably negate that potential signal. And this is what I wrote in my column this morning. I wrote something along the lines of, do watch for signals, but don't anticipate them, okay? So if you see that bow tie coming together, get ready to form, even though it looks a little ominous in here, wait for the actual signal. Now, if you say, well, Dave, it kind of looked like a first thrust down, and I'll give you that. Well, wait, let, let that market rally a little bit to complete that signal. And if the rally turns into brand new highs, okay, then you dodge the bullet and you avoided that sell-off. There's a lot of people out there, and trust me, I was one of them 20 years ago or 15 years ago at least, okay, at least 15 years ago, that tried to call every zig and zag and tried to call every top. And you'll get yourself into a lot of trouble doing that. So, I think following is the key word in trend following. You just have to let things unfold and not get too excited one day to the next. Now, I am slightly encouraged that we're having a rally today. I'd feel a lot better if this rally would continue, but so far, so good. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. A lot of the same characteristics as the S&P 500. Notice that we did pull back to this prior little breakout level in here and um, so far so good we bounced off of it and yes with yesterday's rally we're beginning to rally out of it and the moving average as you can see we're trying to cross over but now as long as price stays above them they're going to cross back up that's one of the features of an exponential moving average is once price closes above it it will turn up once cl price is closed below it, it will turn down fairly quickly. Um, it, it happens, in fact, I don't know exactly if it's always one day. Greg Morris was, taught me that a while back, and he's, I think he's, it might even be one day. Yeah, you could see you got one day up. Yeah, and the moving averages, the exponentials have already turned. Notice that your simple, which is a 10-day, hasn't turned up just yet, okay, because that data is equal weighted, and so far, we're adding in lower numbers still than we were 10 days ago, okay? But that exponential is going to change faster, and that's what probably helps to make that bow tie work so nicely and to give us that nice, nice, tight, tight cross that we get sometimes in this beautiful uh, bow tie patterns. Uh, that looks like a, like a bow tie. And like right here, in, in this, and you can see we got a nice little sell-off. I guess your real signal would have been there. That's a pretty serious sell-off. That's nothing to sneeze at. That's uh, several hundred points in an index. That's a big deal, okay? But it didn't turn out to the mother 
of all tops. By the way, I'm more interested in this bow tie because it's coming off of an all time, I'm sorry, a multi-year high than I am in this bow tie back up because this bow tie is coming mid-range. Now, I know some bloggers will talk about these bow ties in here. Sometimes they'll even mention my name, but um, usually they don't. But those, if you do see a blogger talking about the mid-level ones, uh, feel free to point out and just say, well, Dave says those are minor signals and not major ones, and, and uh, he's, he's, he doesn't get that excited about it. Let him know. But in the P's, like I said, here's your major signal here because it's coming off of all-time highs, and this would be a minor signal back up, okay? What's kind of cool in the sector actions is that the, uh, a lot of these areas, in no particular order, that have pulled back fairly deeply, kind of like the market itself, obviously so far are coming back nicely. Insurance is one that comes to mind that has done that. Uh, health services is another one that's done that. Uh, health care plans within health services, same thing there. Uh, drugs, sort of the same sort of picture here. Now coming back up. Simi's looking pretty good here. Same sort of pullback. Now they're going right back up in here. And this is why we don't get too excited when the market begins to spill a little bit because we don't know whether or not it's going to be a pullback or the start of something bigger. And that's where you got to look for clues and you got to look at all these sectors every day and look at all these stocks every day and listen to the database. Now, if you do have a really serious spill and you have a mediocre bounce from it, then you'll start seeing a lot of short setting up, in which case you go out and you start firing off a short or two. The point I'm trying to make here and I don't know if I'm kind of backing into it or not, is that you got to be really careful with these big, big picture predictions. And instead of doing that, just go in and say, okay, I want to just honor my stops on my existing positions just in case. I want to be selective on new positions because the market isn't necessarily a um, going in a straight line, okay? And... Once, I also want to wait for entries to make sure that the position will actually trigger before I get in. I don't want to try to jump the gun, especially if the market becomes a little iffy in here. If we get in a rip-roaring bull market where the market just goes up and up and up and up and up, everything will work, and you don't have to worry as much about all these things that I talk about week in and week out here. Okay. All right, so that's the semi. Semis are looking pretty good. SMH was actually set up coming into today. Um, and it's looking pretty good. I, I think if it takes out today's high, it could actually still be a buy in here. You can see it's got a little bit of an opening gap reversal. So that's a little bit of a bummer, but let's not read into the micro too much. I mean, if we close negative on the day, I'm going to be really bummed out. And then we ha we'll have a whole bunch of other stuff to talk about. But so far, uh, things are kind of shaping up in here. Uh, aerospace or defense, whatever you want to call it, looked like it was, it was in kind of trouble here. It pulled back to this prior little base, but then now it looks like it's back off to space <laughs> in here. So for the most part, a lot of areas have done that. There are a few obvious areas that are just kind of been melting down in here and still look like they're in trouble, like the energies you can see. And then metals and mining also look like they're in a lot of trouble. And this is why you don't bottom fish. Uh, you know, they look kind of cheap here, 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 okay? Yeah, one of these times it'll bottom, but you're going to go broke trying to catch a bottom there. And gold and silver stocks, that's where a lot of people like to bottom fish. I would strongly urge you not to do that, okay? Um, I guess the only caveat would be if you really, really, really believed in the company, and uh, even even then I, I, would, I would caution you against it. I know someone who has accumulated a, a massive amount of shares in a silver company, uh, the problem is he doesn't he doesn't trade out of them when the company's high and he just sits on them. And the, the problem with that is if you do the company would never go out of business, then it'd be okay. But something bad could always happen, no matter how great you think a company is. You can see gold might be making a double bottom in here. We don't trade off the double bottom, but we trade off a bow tie after a double bottom, right? Or a first thrust after a double bottom, or maybe a, a cup and handle with a bow tie or something like that. So, But there's no reason to get excited just yet. As a trend follower, don't anticipate too much. Just be patient. And it takes a while to get that patience. Uh, somebody pointed out last week uh, very nicely that there is a head and shoulders bottom in silver stocks. I can't argue with that. Uh, 
is it time to buy them? No. Wait for some sort of trigger. Okay. Take your classical technical analysis and use it kind of as a general broad stroke as a framework and then put your or wait for your I should say setups and patterns or whatever you trade to actually occur and of course wait for the triggers before getting too excited so it's nothing to do in gold and silver by the way um I should uh, I should make a list of all of these there's a um a lot of lists coming out right now. Best stocks of 2014, worst stocks of 2014. Um, don't get too caught up in that. As I've been saying quite a bit, I think gold and silver could be the best stocks of 2014. And unfortunately, and I'm still along a bunch of them, so I hope it doesn't happen too soon. But unfortunately, biotech and some of these uh, sectors that have been going straight up could be the worst stocks of 2014. Usually... That, that massive trend doesn't necessarily carry into year two, okay? Just as an FYI. So I think at some point next year, gold will bottom. Uh, what did I say? June 15th around noon is my prediction on that. Obviously, I'm uh, joking. But I do think that gold and silver will bottom next year, and we could see some fantastic buying opportunities. But you have to be patient. And you don't have to stare at this chart every day and wait and wait and wait and hope and hope and hope. All you do is you just do your analysis every day, and when these skull stocks start popping up as possible buys, then what do you do? Well, you start buying them, provided that you have an entry on them. Um, I think that's good for now. There's a couple areas out there that's stinking up the joint, like uh, telecom. It's been looking abysmal forever. But for the most part, in, you know, energies and metals and any of these obvious sectors, Aside, for the most part, most areas still looking pretty good in here, at or near new highs, like the overall market itself. I think that's enough for the sector action for now. Let's just take a look at gold commodity. Uh, you can see nothing to do here, just, just kind of chop it around. So let it do its deal. Let it do its deal. Let it do what it's going to do, and then um, wait for setups, okay? All right, I've got a couple of write-ins, and I've got a couple of people. Let's let's bang out this Cali right away because I have as a write-in, and somebody's also asking about it. John says, in view of the size of the rally, would Cali be considered, should not be considered for a pullback? That's a tough question because in the stocks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you both sides of the coin, and then I'm going to tell you my opinion. Um, in the stock selection course, I cautioned everyone against what I call um, bottle rockets. And a bottle rocket is a stock that goes straight up several hundred percent over a few days, and then it comes right back in. If, you, um, if you've if you ever been around fireworks, a bottle, if you're a redneck in the south like I am, then, you know, fireworks, you would understand. <laughs> you know what that is. You know what a bottle rocket is. A bottle rocket is <laughs> it takes off like it's going to go to the moon. And then it quickly fizzles out. So it's very disappointing once they actually um, finish off there. But um, so in a normal stock, if I'd see this, I would say stay away from it. In an IPO, on your first initial move, sometimes it can be worthwhile to trade these type of, um, of uh, settings. Okay. So ideally, where you want to be in, you want to be in on one of these pioneer trades before the bottle rocket occurs. Um, I think at this juncture, this one has become too dangerous to trade. But as a general statement, I will take a look at bottle rockets in IPOs, especially if it's a first big move out like this one. Okay, So if you do trade it, just make sure you trade at a fairly small size. The real money in the IPOs, and that's what I'm going to probably focus on tomorrow, just so I could hopefully knock it out of the park again, is I'm going to focus on the pioneer type setups and the newer issues, those that haven't been out as long, and then getting in a first little breakout, which I will, which I have defined in the course, and that's really the time to get into these. So I think this one, you know, let, let me t let me just kind of interview myself. Is it is it a viable setup? I'm going to say yes, but I, I think it's too dangerous at this juncture to trade. And, if the, and again, if this was an established stock, I would say avoid it at all costs. But uh, I would I would say, as a general statement, just to go ahead and avoid it, okay? Heather wants to know about Lulu. 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 Um, 
And she wants to know, has it turned around? It, yeah, it looks like it's turned a corner. Um, it has a lot of bad memories and gaps and things along the way, though. So it wouldn't be one of my favorite stocks to trade because, uh, first of all, it kind of trades like electric cardiogram. You can see it makes these big gaps up and gaps down. So that's one problem with it. But, yeah, I think you're right. I think it has turned a corner. Looks like it's bottomed out in here, but I wouldn't trade it because it's got too many bad memories along the way. So I would avoid that one. Frenchie wants to know about DDD, which is a. I saw. Um, I didn't get a chance to look at it because somebody there was people crowded all around it. Um, but it looks like Lowe's had like a Dremel 3D printing machine uh, they were selling, which is kind of cool. I didn't get a chance to look at it, but um, looks like this whole excitement has kind of fizzled a little bit, huh? And that's the. That's what markets do, okay? Um, you know, back here, this uh, 3D printing, you know, you you need a uh, prosthetic, let's go print you one. You need a gun, let's go print you one. Uh, what do you, what else do you need, you know? Um, just go, let's just go print you one, whatever you need, which is pretty cool, you know? Um, I just came in, will you send it in recording? Uh, I will give you a recording, yes, because you just uh, you just bought the IPO course. But uh, in general, I, I record these and I put them in a flash drive later. So live shows are free, and there's a nominal cost for a recorded show. Uh, but yeah, you get you could get recording. Um, Zareer, I uh, hope I said your name right. Um, anyway, so there was all this excitement in the 3D. This is why we use stops, okay, in money management because there's look at all this euphoria in these 3D printing companies. And then now look where this company is. Um, so if you want to buy it, I think that would be a bad idea. Uh, if you want to short it, I hear you, and it is a pullback type of setup on the short side. But it looks like it's it's already lost well over half of its value. So I wouldn't be as excited to rush out and short this one uh, just yet or at all because it, it's so at such low levels. On the short side, I prefer to catch stocks when they're in that early phases of breaking down, when they're in a transitional type of phases. And we might have had this one, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we might have had this one as a first thrust back here, made a little and then got stopped out on a remainder. I don't remember. It's been a while. I, I tend to I tend to forget stocks the day it um, um, stops out. So I'll probably forget RAD by tomorrow. Okay, DDD, perfect example of formal hot stocks that corrected 72% after they peak, according to us, Investors Business Daily. A 72% correction, that's kind of stupid uh, if you think about it. Um, that's not a correction. That's a bona fide sell-off. That's a bona fide, uh, you're, you're, you're wiped out if you bought a stock and you let it drop 72%, okay? So I wouldn't call it a 72% correction. I mean, that's just kind of, that's ludicrous, okay? I don't know why you call it that. But, yeah, I mean, you know, we're traders, okay? And that's why in, in the IPO course, and then if you look on the, um, you know, I wonder if I could find it for you. I can't find it quickly for you. But if you go watch the IPO uh, teaser webinar, if you want to call it that, teaser course that I put up on YouTube, I talk about the sardine story. I'm not going to bore you with that again. Don't worry. But... And that's why I have, uh, I'm looking at it right now, I've got a, a, a street sign in my office that says Sardine Drive. And it reminds me that we're traders. And this is why we're traders. I mean, this thing just went went up 100%, and then now it's down 70%, okay? So we're here to make money, and we're here to get on and ride as long as we can. Wording might be might not be right, by, but point is buy and hold does not work. Sardines do. Yeah, if you ever get confused, you could you could always go to www.whybuyandholddoesnotwork.com. And if you get confused, you go to www.whybuyandhold does not work. And where does that bring you? Comes back to DaveLandry.com. And I will tell you every day why buy and hold does not work. 
But I'd hold does not work, sardines do. Okay. IDRA for Andre. Yeah. Heck yeah. Well, all right. Let me catch a little bit now. You got some bad memories there. I thought this was all time lows. In fact, let me see if this was. I had this one on the list not too long ago somewhere. Um, but yeah, my initial excitement. Let me tell you, my initial excitement is that this thing kind of took off it here, and then it pulled back. Okay, almost a little too much as far as it's. It does have a little bottle rocket characteristic. But now that I'm looking at back further, it's got some bad memory, so I would pass based on that. But yeah, if all you were left to deal with was this over here, this looks pretty good because you got a big old base that it broke out of, and then it's like your first pullback after afterwards. But I would pass based on that. Okay, can you send me a write up because uh, my friends don't believe in buy and hold? I need to let them know why. Well, I mean. It's every day I talk about it, so I don't have anything in particular except in layman's guide. Um, he wants to. This, somebody's asking me to give them some write-ups on, on buy and hold. But uh, uh, 2009, I think, or 2008, I should say, when the when the S and P, the S and P 500, loses 50 something percent of its value, loses half of its value. So let's say you've been saving your little money for quite a long time. You're ready to retire. You know, and at the example that Greg uses is, uh, Greg Morris uses, let's say you had a million dollars and that was enough for you to retire on. Uh, well, year like 2000 comes along and now you've lost half of your money. So a million dollar retirement and a half a million dollar retirement, that's a big, uh, there's a big difference. A lot of lifestyle changes that have to occur between a half a million and a million dollars. I mean, if you're going to try to let that last for the rest of your life. So there's a test of it right there. But if you get layman's, um, have them read layman's, and then um, I I'll, give, I'll give you some excerpts out of layman's on, on the fact that buy and hold doesn't work. But, it's, you know, it's like just, just look at the market. It's all you really have to do. Show them the NASDAQ. Show them the NASDAQ at 2000 when it lost 73% of its value and that's not a retracement okay that's yeah you know, let's say you win some momentum stocks back then so you lost 73 percent that's almost a complete wipeout as far as i'm concerned so yeah that's buy and hold does not work and it's it's been sold to people and it's the and they drink the kool-aid and as long as there is a bull market okay like since 2009 you know these people have been Preaching and teaching, buy and hold, buy and hold. Well, you look like a genius until what happens? The next bear market comes along. And go back and look at the last hundred years of stocks if you want to. Bull markets come along, bear markets come along. Read read classical uh, literature on technical analysis such as Livermore. Read uh, Reminiscences of a Stock Trade. I got it right here on my desk. I keep it on my desk usually. Get bored, flip through it. You know, it's a plethora of good information there. And that'll help to make the case, too. All right, I digress. I don't know why big stocks, but how – I know you don't like big stocks, but how about Walmart as an entry here? Well, you know, I don't like them until they move. Um, yeah, I mean, it looks okay. Uh, but, you know, the HV is 19. It's pretty low. Uh, but I hear you. Uh, and also, I think that um, – didn't this one come out of like a – yeah, remember when this – the big news here was when this one came out of a um, – like a 10-year base. So you're coming out of this uh, – or even longer, 17-year base? Is that what it was? I forget exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I can't really fault you on that. It's, it's, it's not – I mean, this is a – from here to here is what two points, okay? That's a two-point move. But – yeah, I mean, it's triggering a pullback out of a big base breakout, kind of a wide and loose base, but a base breakout nonetheless. So I can't fault you for that as a trend guy, okay? And then this will probably, I mean, this will probably show up in like some major book on technical analysis at some point in time as a, you know, I mean, look at this sideways action for years and years and years and years, and then it finally took off in here. So, yeah, I can't fault you on that. Um 
with if you look on my website, read the Go Go Nomo, and I've got to spend some time organizing things because I have I hate to brag, but I've got a lot of good stuff. But if you come under education, under free education, and that's a really good thing to do with efficient stocks is the um, the Go Go Nomo. Let me see if I can find it for you. Yeah, right here. So a shorting strategy for high relative strength stocks. So read this article if you get a chance. And that's where I like to short like a GME or some kind of one-dimensional stock that's coming off of high levels. Okay. Uh, and the efficient stock, a thick stock, that's that's where your real opportunities are because that's when it can really make an inefficient type of move. But I hear you. GMCR, yeah, that's been on the Landry list for quite a while as a possible short. And that's a great example of a go-go domo. In fact, that's one that was used in the article back here. Um, I think this is when I was on a, uh, I was on an institutional project a while back, and I think this was one that I recommended as a short. Another one was what? What's that stupid uh, Chipotle Chipotle Grill, whatever? That was another one that just kind of imploded. Um, is a go-go nomo, but yeah, this one you got to thrust down, you had to pull back. This was on the Landry list back here. I wonder what date that was. I don't think I have them going back that far. Twelve oh one. No, I don't. I've, I've deleted those. Um, but yeah. Oops, I'm fat fingering some things. But now it's not as exciting, to, you know. And then it kind of set it set up again here. And I might have mentioned it again on that twelve eleven. Let me see if I had it on that date. Twelve eleven. Yeah, right here. See, I had it as a possible short. Okay. But now it's kind of meandering in here. I think I would leave it alone, especially now that the market's kind of getting its act back together. Okay. But I hear you. I mean, it's kind of single dimensional CMG. Yeah. CMG. I've never eaten there. It's. I had an older person tell me it's, it's mush, and I'm kind of thinking, well, isn't that what Mexican food is? Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah, it's up here, brand new highs again. This is when we shorted it back here, and this is when I was on an institutional project. I remember this one because it was just a big, perfect, perfect, perfect stock for an institution because it's it's um, just huge cap and huge price and getting ready to implode. But, yeah, there's nothing here now. But it's making me hungry for lunch. IDRA. I need to. <sighs> like everyone. Not everyone. but Yeah, we talked about this one or did we not? Yeah, this one looks good shorter term. It's got some bad memories, but it's okay. Um, it might have been on my list recently, but you can see it's coming out of a pullback. So it looks okay. HSY I'm probably not going to like. Unless it's a short. Yeah, I mean, it's got an HV of um, 14. What are the spiders? Anyone? 14, okay. So it's it's in line with the overall market. You know, my feeling is, my feeling is if you're going to beat the market, you need to have stocks that can move more than the market. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong, but go in and look at the archives of what I've done, what I've done, and you'll see where we beat the market with these higher beta stocks. So, um, you know, I can't get that excited about this stock, at least not at this juncture. You never say never, but – and then there's really, there's really nothing there. I mean, you've got some trading back here, some overhead. Um, I think I'm going to pass on that one. Bitta as a short for Miss Heather. Good to see you again, Heather. Um. It doesn't jump out at me, but I, I sort of see it. It's kind of pulling back, you know, short along, short, yes. But I don't think I'd rush out and short it. It just doesn't jump out at me as a possible short. Um, maybe if it took out this uh, 60 or something on a pullback, but I don't know. It's it's not really um, jumping out at me. Long INCR for Mr. Howard. We got a nice bunch here today. Good to see you guys. Yeah, uh, it looks okay. Uh, you know, my problem here is uh, with an IPO, I want some excitement. Okay, I want to see a stock really take off and then play that first pullback. And this one went from twenty to twenty-five. 
Don't get me wrong, that's an okay move, but it's not enough to really get that excited about, okay? So, and it's not set up anyway, but yeah, it's okay to keep it on your radar, but I don't see any reason to uh, to buy it, at least at this juncture. SWI, on a pullback. Well, you got a lot of bad memories. I know they're a long time ago, but there's a lot of bad memories back here with this stock. And markets have pretty long memories, so you got to remember that. Uh, no, I would pass. Not even on the, because notice that you you broke out here, you broke out right here, and then you pulled all the way back to where you broke out. Okay. So and the other thing, always it, this was in the stock selection course too. It's like the this market kind of went straight up, and then it kind of went like this way. Okay. And that was one of the things. In fact, that's even in the. Um, I even talked about that in a YouTube that I did on, on stock selection. So make sure you watch that intro video. So that's got a deceleration of trend. Um, I hear what you're saying. It's kind of popping up from this pullback, but this pullback is too far. So I would leave that alone for all those aforementioned reasons. Okay. Nate's been waiting patiently for SCMP. SCMP. Um, yeah, that's pretty interesting there, Nate. Um, It's a little on the thin side, but not too, too thin. Uh, it's had a nice run in here. Uh, but now it's kind of stalling out and it's pulled back. So I would have to, I would pass for now. If you're already long, stay long because it looks pretty good. But what I would do is wait for it to break out to brand new highs and then look to play that next pullback. And hopefully uh, we'll see a little acceleration higher in the, in the whole thing. Okay. Thanks for waiting. MDT for Mr. Phil. MDT. A little low on the HV. Um, kind of thick. But I don't think I can really argue with it too much. The only thing that kind of jumps out at me is this. You only got this one wide range bar here, and then it kind of drifted higher. I would probably pass on it based on that. But as a general statement, first look, gut reaction, um, I'd say it looks pretty good, but I, you know, I like to pick things apart a little bit. I'd probably pick it apart based on that, but I certainly can't argue with you. And I'm not just going to not argue with you because you're a client, but <laughs> NBIX. NBIX. This one can be kind of crazy. We were short this one once and it imploded overnight, lost like half its value. Uh, maybe on a pullback. I mean, it's kind of a crazy one, but yeah, on a pullback, why not? I mean, I think I just put this one into like, um, I don't know if I have it physically in the list, but yesterday I made a note to add it to my Landry 100, I think. DM on a breakout. <laughs> you always argue the most I ever expect is not bad. I'll tell you if I really, if I really don't like anything. If I really don't like it, I'll beat you up, uh, client or not. I probably shouldn't beat up clients, but I want them to do the right thing. Uh, DM, uh, no, there's nothing to do here. This would have to break out to new highs, and then we'll look to play pullbacks along the way. FFIV, well, you pick better stocks, Phil. That's why I don't pick on you as much. You know, if what's his name is here asking about what you call it, then I might have to beat you up, beat him up. Uh, no, this stock is just kind of going sideways in here. You know, and this is this is actually in, and there's a lot of good stuff. Not to not to brag or soft sell, but there's a lot of good stuff, and this is free. Go in and watch the stock selection webinar, uh, the teaser edition. Okay. And you can see that one of the things you need to do is just draw your horizontal lines and see where the stock is now and see what it was weeks or months ago. And then the other thing, like we showed earlier, or I show quite often, and this is also in that video, notice that the trend line here is nice and sharp and up, and then that trend line begins to roll over. So this is a market that has decelerated and lost some momentum. So I would be less excited about it because of that. Now, if it broke out decisively, above this prior peak and it's sort of kind of going straight up, 
maybe on a pullback it might be worth a while, but I would leave that one alone. But Heather, go watch that video. It's a, it's a go on my YouTube channel and check it out. <laughs> Phil is stirring the shit. Uh, he wants to know about Ford. You know better than that, Ford. He wants to see if I'll if I'll talk bad about him. Ah, uh, no, there's nothing here. It's, it it went up. It goes down. Uh no, there's nothing there. Uh, it's all over the place. Looks like it's in trouble though. I think. Uh, OAS. I think there's a short left in it. OAS. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, Sherry. I, I was gonna get to that. I forgot. I I didn't see you in here. <laughs> um. Thanks for reminding them. Uh, OAS, it looks like a possible short. I mean, this is kind of like a late stage short. I mean, that's the only problem. Uh, but I hear you. I mean, this thing is this thing is just uh, going straight down forever. Uh, at this point, you're probably also betting on that uh, that that uh, oil is going to continue its 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 spill. No pun intended. It was funny you know, on SNL. They said um, oil is like fifty five dollars a barrel, whatever it was, and they said uh, at that price. The barrel's a good deal, you know? <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but I hear you. It looks good. I just think you can, at this juncture, maybe try to find something that's coming down from higher levels. AAP for Shea. Okay. Um, I mean, it's okay. It's a, it's, it's a lower HV stock. It's definitely trending, uh, and it can trend. It's not exactly – I'd like to see – to have seen a little bit more knockout move in its knockout, and it's no longer uh, set up. Uh, before I forget, I actually got a couple of requests for Baba today, so let's take a look at it. No, Baba's not too efficient. I guess it can – it is probably becoming too efficient. Baba was set up as a pullback back here, and I was in a – I was in a radio or – either radio or internet um, interview. And I said it would have to give above 115, and it'd have to do that within a week. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So at this point in time, that setup was negated. So now this is no longer a pullback. This is just kind of meandering along. This stock would have to break out to new highs and then first pull back. But yeah, big, thick. It's getting really thick in here. I mean, I can't even do that math in my head. That's one, two, 274 million shares on average. I mean, that's ridiculous. U and P for Tom. Lots of uh, good questions today. Uh, the railroads have been kind of in trouble. What's that? Uh, what's Western Break? Anybody know the symbol for that? Is it W A B? Um, you know, all these railroad type of stocks are beginning to look like they're they're kind of rolling over in here. So I'd leave it alone. It kind of made a gatekeeper back here, and then it sold off out of that. Now it's getting a little pop today. Um, let's just see if this market could follow through to the upside before we start doing some shorts in here. I, I'm impressed with you guys looking at the shorts, though, so I don't want to. I don't want to encourage you from not doing that, but I'm just thinking let's just um, let's just let things shake out a little bit, okay? All right, I got a couple of write-ins here. Uh, OVAS. Let me just get these out of the way real quick before I forget them. Uh, now this was coming into today. Oh well, um, too late now. <laughs> yeah, this is a um, this one took off nicely in here, and yeah, it looked pretty good coming in. See, it's hard to tell with today's data in here. It looked okay coming into today, or, or you can see it's a pretty pretty nice trend in here, and then it sort of pulled back a little bit too much to the breakout, but it was okay. Set up, and then uh, of course it did take off. But yeah, it's too late now. But yeah, if you played that one, um, who are these write-ins for? Uh, James, James, if you played that one, then congratulations. But it's too late now. Uh, this is a case where it's an IPO, but it really didn't make that impressive of a move. Do you remember that other one we we're looking at a little while ago? It went up like five points. It was a twenty-dollar stock. So it only ran up five points. It pulled back. I hear you, okay? So it did kind of rally out of the pullback. But I want to see something more significant in an IPO for me to get excited, okay? ANAC? <laughs> WAS. 
Don is here. We're going to talk about him, and now he shows up. Uh, ADAC is not bad, and it's kind of faked out a little bit today, so um, maybe around here would be a good entry on it. Yeah, that one's not bad. Uh, you know, my only concern with something like ANAC is you're in a late stage phase, okay? And yeah, it might go on a double from here, but I'm 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 more excited about something like a Ruby or something, R U B I, which we are long. Okay. Which is uh you know, maybe it's in the early phases of trend, maybe it could double or triple from here, whereas this one, I don't know, I think it's gonna have a harder time doubling or tripling, but I can't fault you on the setup because it has everything I talk about uh, in it. It's got a nice, fairly persistent move, a nice, fairly deep pullback. So yeah, about 35 or so a trigger on that would probably work uh, for James. And then finally, T-SIM for James, and we'll get to the rest of the use. And uh, Don is here. We'll get to. We'll take another look at his Ford in one second. Um, this would have some bad memories along the way, but they might be far enough away to where it doesn't would be a good problem to have. Um, yeah, it kind of broke out, and then it pulled all the way back to its breakout. I think you could probably find better out there. I mean, take a look at SMH, which is just your, um, if I can get it to come up, which is semi holders. The semi holders actually look a little bit cleaner than than that particular stock, so I'd, I'd take a look there. John says, F, Merry Christmas. Have a safe New Year holiday. See you in three weeks. All right, Don. So next three weeks we'll talk about Ford. I might be taking off one day of that holiday. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just nothing for me. It came all the way back down to its prior little. It tried to rally and came all the way back in. It's just nothing there. Loco. We'll see. Oh. Uh, yeah, it might still be hard to borrow. But, yeah, on a pullback, I hear you. Um, I mean, you know, there's a there's a bottle rocket for you, but. Like I said, an IPO, sometimes they're tradable. ACHN. Okay. Uh, no, it's just wide and loose. I mean, draw your... It would have to break out of that range for me to get excited about it. Tesla. DSLA. You know, they're blaming their slide on oil prices. Uh, you know, again, I get a little, th little news through osmosis. When did all prices ever have anything to do with the Tesla? Okay, it's like, I'm going to go buy a $100,000 electric car. And then they put some fuzzy math on their website, you know, like, uh, well, uh, you'd have to put like, you got to put like 20000 down or 30000 down. I forget what it is. Whatever you put down is like the same price as an economy car would be. You know, it's like, it's almost like buying an economy car. And then, so, you know, you put $100,000 into a car. So you could save on gas? Like, I don't get it. So they have some fuzzy math on their website. And I think their fuzzy math, pardon my French, is biting them in the ass <laughs> now that oil prices are lower. So their fuzzy math becomes even fuzzier. Uh, you want to talk about trading a stock? Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't like today's gap in it. But if it fills this gap in here, it, it could be get kind of interesting as a possible short. Uh, but it looks like it looks like a, a major top is in place for that stock. And stick a fork in it; and it's done. Vips is a short. You know, I kind of have mixed emotions because I I, I do want these newer technology con companies to succeed. But I mean, who could? Who would, who who wants to run out and buy a hundred thousand dollar car just because it's electric? You're not going to do it to save money on gas. Uh, this stock looks like it's in trouble. Maybe on a little bit of a pullback, but um, I'd like it better if it had dropped below this little peak in here, uh, or if this was further up. You might get a little uh, thing around there. Could you go over the concept of gatekeeper? Yeah, gatekeeper is a uh, it's from my second book, and uh, it's a fairly – I like them on the short side more than the long side. And what you're looking for – this is the closest thing to a reversal that I'll trade. And I don't trade them that often. It's kind of one of those ancillary type of setups. But you're looking for a sharp sell-off and then a sharp retracement back up. Now, I have the Fibonacci of a 618 
and a 786 in here. But I tend to eyeball it, and it's when that market stalls somewhere at one of these numbers, and then you're looking to short the market. So it's kind of look like look like that. Okay, I get a lot of questions about is this a gatekeeper? No, that's not a gatekeeper. You want to see a sharp sell off like this. It has to look like a reverse check mark. Like that's a check mark. It needs to look like a reverse check mark. If you can, like a mirror image of a check mark. And then sometimes you get like an opening gap reversal down. And what's kind of cool about the pattern is remember what I said earlier about big picture technical analysis. Sometimes what you might want to have, oops. Let's say you got a, a head and shoulders, and the head and shoulders is kind of textbook in nature where that right side is, is higher than the left, okay? Sometimes you get that gatekeeper pattern in here and sets up, and that's kind of a cool pattern to trade, okay? But, yeah, it's in the second book. And you know what? I'm feeling generous, so email me, and I will send you the chapter, and that goes to anyone who is here today. If you're taking time on a busy schedule, I will be happy to help you out. How's that? Merry Christmas. Is Christmas next Thursday? I don't guess I'll see you next Thursday then, huh? Yeah, next Thursday. Wow. I better start shopping. AMBA. Um, it's okay. I mean, that was on the list like from a week ago, as you can see. Um, you guys look at my list too much. Let's get off of this. But now it's kind of pulled too back too far. It's pulled back to this prior little uh, breakout level here. So I, I would leave it alone now. DRIV for Karen. Karen, are you outside the States? I always forget. DRIV. Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> it gapped up. It imploded. It gapped up. You're not trying to trade that, are you? That has nothing to do with my methodology. OAS, is there any short left in it? Did we look at that one, Heather? I think we did. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe down to the old lows of the swing trade, but, again, it's not um, not enough. XNPT. Um, it pulled back too far. This was one that's been on my list for a while, but now it's kind of pulled back um, in, in too many days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 19, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 18, 18, 18 days at a pullback. That's a little too much. Yeah, we covered it. Sorry. Gatekeeper was in the second book. Uh, Zareer, um, send me an email, and I'll shoot you the pattern. Like I said, Mr. Generous today. AFSI on a pullback. Uh, it's kind of wide and loose. It would have to... It would have to kind of accelerate a little bit to get me excited and then pull back, okay? Clear mush on Netflix. Well, it's sort of, yeah, um... It's kind of all over the place, but I hear you, um, Phil. I think it's still, I think it's a trouble, but it's all over the place. I'd be careful trading again. You know, this is a stock where I would maybe look for some puts or something on it, and if they were attractive, go after them. I don't want to open up that can of worms too much, um, but I don't know if I would trade it outright just based on the. the the, the way it trades in these big chunks, and it's just all over the place. But, yeah, puts might work on that one. I was in Germany from when I'm driving weekly. looks like another gatekeeper setting up. Driving a weekly? No, that's not a gatekeeper. Uh, no one would do any TA on it, so I thought I'd ask you. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, 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 it's just all over the place. No, that's not a gatekeeper because... Um, no, it's just you got this huge gap here. Is that a buyout? I mean, what what caused that to happen? So I would leave it alone as soon as that happened, and then obviously whatever happened came back in, and then now for some reason it's back up here. It just it's just too crazy. D P L O exclamation point D P L O. Yeah, I want to pull back. Um, why not? I want to pull back. It's certainly trending. I mean, draw your line. Sure. 
P-E-B, P-E-B, P-E-B. Uh, it's a REIT. I'm not really excited about REITs, but hey, you know, REITs have been moving lately. Maybe on a pullback. It's a REIT, you know. Yeah. Blah. <laughs> BEC, we do that one. BEC. Thank you, Heather. Heather says another great webinar. Yeah, uh, a little bit more pullback on the BEC. Who asked that? Uh, whoever asked that. A little bit more pullback. That might be worth a shot. Thank you, Heather. FCAU, FCAU. Um, this one looks like it. Uh, sorry about that. No, I'm slurping there. Uh, this one looks like it might be in trouble now. Um, it actually triggered right here, which is kind of cool as an IPO. Uh, but it looks like it's in trouble now. You got to thrust down. It's pulling back a little bit. Uh, Fiat, fix it again, Tony. <laughs> LC for John. LC. Oops. Uh, not set up yet. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Um, it's been out long enough to start trading it, but it's not set up. We'll just leave it at that. XNPT has a stock pullback too much to make a pullback entry. Yes. Yes. I mean, if anything, it looks like it's at the early phases of being in trouble here. And, you know, always, again, and, and watch that YouTube on the intro to stock selection, Always look at your net net change, and then in, in telechart you can punch your C key, and uh, your C key will tell you what the what the change is, or it'll draw the trend line for you at least, and just kind of noodle with that a little bit. You can see, okay, eleven thirteen to twelve eighteen, it's lost a half a percent. It hasn't done anything, so it's lost steam. So that's one way, or count the bars and you pull back. Okay, FCAU, we did yeah, we did that one. Fix it again, Tony. Z S P H. Um, this one's okay. I'll give it an okay. I mean, it broke out, pulled back. I'll give it an okay. It's not jumping out at me, but I could certainly give it an okay. It's a little on the thinner side. It's a it's a newer issue. Uh, I'm gonna give it an okay. Uh, maybe like entry around 46 or so. Uh, not my favorite setup in the world, but I certainly can't fault you on that one. Uh, so, good eye, AFSI. Okay. Uh, yeah, we covered this one. It's, it's going to have to accelerate higher than maybe on a pullback. Okay. All right. Looks like we're uh, almost done. Any more questions on stocks? While we're at impasse, I want to obviously thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time and your busy schedule to be here. Um, I guess next week's Christmas, so we won't have a show. To those who celebrate, Merry Christmas. And um, any other questions? Any uh, questions unanswered or anything you want that I mentioned in the show, shoot me an email, and I will uh, be happy to cover that for you. A couple of last-minute ones in here, Z-E-S-P-H. Yeah, we just did this one, I think. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Um. Yeah, we just we covered that one already. Anyway, uh, thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate you time, taking time in your busy schedule. Um, everyone have a fantastic new year. We'll see you uh, early next year. Uh, be safe out there if you um, travel around. And then, um, thank you so much. Thanks for coming all year. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm humbled by your presence. I appreciate your uh, you being here. Yeah, tomorrow's gonna be the IPO webinar. Tomorrow's a Friday webinar. See my website for more than that. Okay, uh, again, uh, Merry Christmas to those who celebrate. Happy New Year uh, to all of us. And then I'll see you next year. Thank you so much.